Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Libby Matei, and I am the Director of Business Development here at Northbridge Companies. Thank you all for joining us tonight. I know that you will truly learn and benefit from tonight's presentation with Dr. Andrew Budson. Uh, first things first, if you were one of the first 15 people to register for this evening's program, um, you will be receiving a copy of Dr. Budson's latest book. I will reach out to you for your mailing address so that I can send them to you. Um, before we get underway with Dr. Budson, I would just like to share a little bit about Northbridge Companies. Uh, you know, we have a portfolio of 19 senior living communities offering independent assisted living and our renowned Avita Memory Care Program. Our Metro West um, and Boston communities are all conveniently located. They're in Wayland, Needham, Burlington, Tewksbury, and Andover. And then we also have several communities on the South Shore, the Cape, Maine, New Hampshire, and Connecticut. We are really proud to be privately owned and Massachusetts based. Our owners, Jim and Wendy, have regular presence here in our communities and often stop by just to say hello to our residents, families, and associates. Every Northbridge community offers the same quality of care in a beautiful setting, but it's really our team of associates who truly make us special. Their compassion and their desire to always be the very best. In fact, I can tell you tonight here at Carriage House, we have quite a few associates who are zooming in to be part of this program and take the opportunity to learn from Dr. Budson. If you'd like to learn more about any of our Northbridge communities, you can stay tuned after the webinar for some contact information. Now, I think I could probably spend the next hour discussing all of Dr. Andrew Budson's accomplishments, but I'm sure you'd rather hear from him directly, so I'm going to keep this short and sweet. Uh, Dr. Budson holds several titles with the veterans um, the VA Boston Healthcare System, including Chief of Cognitive and Behavioral Neurology, Associate Chief of Staff for Education, and Director of the Center for Translational Cognitive Neuroscience. He's also the Associate Director and Leader of the Outreach, Recruitment, and Engagement Corps of the Boston University Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. He's a Professor of Neurology at the Boston University School of Medicine and a Lecturer in Neurology at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Budson is the medical director of the Boston Center for Memory in Newton as well. I'm thinking there's more than 24 hours in his day because he's also found time to author his latest book, which he will be discussing this evening, Six Steps to Managing Alzheimer's Disease and Dementia, A Caregiver's Guide. Dr. Budson, you're clearly a very busy man and I sincerely thank you for taking the time this evening to share some of your wisdom from your latest book with us. We are all truly looking forward to hearing from you. So take it away. Uh, why, thank you very much. Uh, before I launch into any talks, I wanna make sure the audio is working okay. There's at least one participant out there who's having trouble and I wanna just make sure that everyone isn't having trouble hearing us. If people could type into the chat that they can hear us, with a little Y, that would be great, or a little yes or a Y. Okay, good, good. We're getting lots of people saying, saying yes. Okay, to the one participant out there who can't hear us, um, it must be something on your end. Okay, very good. Well, it really is wonderful. Thank you, uh, uh, Libby and Jen and everyone else, Kristen, for uh, inviting me. Uh, this evening. So uh, we are going to um, have, I, I think, an interesting and uh, maybe even a fun program. It's a serious topic, but I hope that we'll uh, still be able to um, have some fun with it. I am going to be talking for about 50 minutes, and then uh, I'll hang around, answer questions almost as long as you would, uh, as long as you would like. And uh, we're going to go back and forth between um, doing a little talking just like this. And I'll also be showing some slides. And I'll read a little bit also from uh, the, the books that I have written that we're going to go over this evening. So I'm going to begin by uh, sharing a couple of uh, slides. And uh, we're going to talk about both the seven steps to managing your memory, uh, as well as the six steps to managing Alzheimer's disease and dementia. 
And we're going to begin by uh, diving into this book a, a little bit. And we are going to uh, learn about the seven steps to managing your memory. And I want to start by reading a couple of <clears throat> uh, points that we have in the, the preface of the book. So uh, and I'm just going to, okay. And uh, Libby, if you can uh, spotlight uh, me for all participants, I think that would be helpful. Thank you very much. So I'm gonna read a few scenarios from the preface. Uh, these are uh, different memory issues that could happen to you, could happen to a loved one. And as I'm reading through these different scenarios, if you say to yourself, this is just what happens when somebody gets a little bit older, that's totally normal. Just say, yes, that's normal in the chat. Just a, a why will do where the word yes uh, into the chat. If on the other hand, as I read off a scenario and you say to yourself, wait a minute, this is not normal. This could be the start of Alzheimer's disease or dementia. Give me a, a no or the letter N so that I know you're saying that is not uh, normal. So here is the uh, first uh, scenario. So you walk into a room to get something and you forget why you're there. What do you think? Is that normal with a yes, not normal with a no? What do you think? All right, good, good. I'm seeing lots of whys, yes is normal. That one is normal. Ooh, thank God, right? We, we would all be in trouble if that one wasn't normal. Okay, how about this one? You're having trouble remembering some of the events of your life, such as your wedding. What do you think? Is that normal, not normal? Uh, getting some more no's, not normal on, on that one. How about this one? When you are driving and not paying attention, you take one or more wrong turns and you end up somewhere you did not intend to be. What do you think? We're getting a split decision on this one. About half the people say that's fine. Half the people say that's not fine. How about this one? You have difficulty finding your car in a parking lot. What do you think? Is that normal? Yes or not normal? No. Uh, another split decision on this one. And how about my all-time favorite? Your family tells you you've asked that question before. Is that normal or not? Well, it is my job this evening to empower you with the knowledge so that you will be able to figure out whether these and other memory problems that you may be experiencing or you may see in a loved one, whether these things are normal, whether they're not, and most importantly, what to do about them. So we are going to launch into the seven steps to managing your memory to empower you uh, with uh, this uh, knowledge here. Okay, very good. So um, we're going to start with step one, which is learn what is normal memory. So let's say there's some important information that you uh, want to uh, remember, such as somebody's uh, name. Well, I'm going to give you a filing system analogy as to how we remember that information. And the first part of the filing system that I want to tell you about is the file clerk. Now, your file clerk is actually a part of your brain. It's your frontal lobes right behind your forehead. And it's the frontal lobe file clerk's job to take that information in from the outside world and to put it into your file uh, cabinet. <clears throat> when we need to retrieve a memory, it's the frontal lobe file clerk's job to take that information uh, out of the file cabinet and retrieve the memory. Now that's good, but guess what? As we all get older, our frontal lobe file clerk is getting older too. 
And I'm going to continue with this analogy to tell you about the three changes that occur in part of normal aging. Well, the first thing I want to tell you is that our frontal lobe file clerk, as she's getting older, she does not hear quite as well as she used to. What? And because of that, as part of normal aging, information may need to be repeated a couple of times in order for our file clerk to get a hold of the information and to put it into the file cabinet. Now, another thing that happens to our older frontal lobe file clerk is she does not move quite as quickly as she used to. And because of that, when she is walking over to the file cabinet to retrieve a memory, it may take her a little bit longer to get the information that she's looking for. The third thing that happens to our older frontal lobe file clerk is she doesn't see quite as well as she used to. And so you can imagine as she's squinting over the file cabinet, she may need a hint or a cue in order to find the information that she's looking for. But importantly, as part of normal aging, as long as the memory made it into the file cabinet, it should be able to be retrieved, even if it takes a little bit of time for a hint or a cue. So now we're gonna switch and talk about some of the changes that occur in Alzheimer's disease. Okay, and here we're gonna continue with our analogy, but now we're gonna focus on the file cabinet. The file cabinet's another part of your brain. It's called the hippocampus deep in your temporal lobes. And the problem in Alzheimer's is that Alzheimer's damages and ultimately destroys the hippocampus. And the way I think about it, it's as if there's a big hole in the bottom of the file cabinet. Now, if there's a hole in the bottom of the file cabinet, you can have the best, most efficient file clerk in the world, pulling information in from the outside world, putting it into the file cabinet. But what's gonna happen? It's gonna disappear, into the hole, never to be retrieved again. And when that happens, <clears throat> even when information is repeated, even if you wait a bit of time or give a hint or a cue, it cannot be retrieved. And when that happens, we call it rapid forgetting. And rapid forgetting is never normal. It should always be evaluated. Now let's talk about some of the other problems that can come up in uh, Alzheimer's disease. And one of these is getting lost. But anybody of any age can get lost. You make a wrong turn, something doesn't look familiar, and bam, you're lost. But what do we all normally do? Well, you can pull out a map from your glove compartment, or maybe this day and age, more likely from your phone. You can use a GPS device, or you can pull over and ask for directions. And using any of those methods, you're back on your way. But with Alzheimer's, paper maps and phone apps and GPS devices can be complicated and confusing to use. You can pull over and ask for directions, but they're often long and detailed and hard to remember. And it's for this reason that people with Alzheimer's have such difficulty getting lost. Now, another common problem in Alzheimer's is losing things, misplacing things. But guess what? Misplacing things is also very common in people of any age. I want you to type a Y or a yes into the chat. If in the last year, you have misplaced your keys, glasses, wallet, pocketbook, cell phone, has that happened to anybody? Yeah, me too. So if you're losing things, if you're misplacing things, how do you know if it's normal? Well, 
if you are someone who every morning, all your life, you know, you spend five, 10, 15 minutes, you know, hunting around the house, you know, trying to find things, you know, and can't remember where you put them. And now you're getting a little bit older and you're still spending five, 10, 15 minutes hunting around the house, looking for things. Well, guess what? That's probably normal for you and not something to worry about. But if you were somebody who was always very organized, always knew exactly uh, where everything was, and now you're spending not only five, 10, 15 minutes, but maybe 20 minutes or an hour hunting around the house looking for things, Maybe you had to buy a new cell phone because it never did turn up. Maybe you had to cancel your credit cards because you never could find that wallet. Well, that could be a problem. So the point I'm trying to make here is it's not only what the problem is, but also whether it represents a change from the way things used to be. The third and last thing that I want to make in this point is about repeating questions and stories. Now, anybody can be halfway through telling a story to a good friend and you say to yourself, oh my God, I told you this already, didn't I? And anybody can forget the answer to a question and ask it again. But when there is a pattern of repeatedly asking the same question to the same people over and over and over again, or telling the same story to the same people again and again and again, that is not normal. That's usually due to that rapid forgetting that we were talking about because people rapidly forget that they told that story or asked that question. And as I mentioned, rapid forgetting is never normal. It should always be evaluated. Okay, so let's move on now to uh, step three, which is understand your memory loss. And we're going to talk about the most common question that I get asked, which is what's the difference between dementia and Alzheimer's? So dementia is when there is a decline in thinking and memory that is severe enough that it interferes with day-to-day -day function. Alzheimer's is one type or one cause of dementia, and it has a specific microscopic pathology that you can look at under the microscope inside the brain. There are other causes of dementia as well. You can have a vascular dementia, which is dementia due to strokes, you can have dementia with Lewy bodies that's similar to Parkinson's disease dementia. You can have frontotemporal dementia that affects behaviors. And there's many other types as well. Now, another uh, common uh, scenario that comes up, another common syndrome is mild cognitive impairment. And mild cognitive impairment is present when there's three things. The first, is that someone is concerned about the memory. It can be the individual themselves, it can be their family, or it can be their doctor. The second thing is that when the individual undergoes pencil and paper testing, yes, indeed, a problem is found. So the concern is confirmed by the pencil and paper testing. But the third thing is that their day-to-day -day function is fine. Now, if their day-to-day -day function is fine, then by definition, they do not have dementia. Now, the studies show if you follow people with mild cognitive impairment over time, about half of them do end up declining and developing either Alzheimer's disease or another cause of dementia. But that also means the other half don't. The other half either stay stable over time or they actually improve might say, how does anybody's memory improve over time? Well, if their memory problems were due to depression, low mood, if their mood lifts, their memory can get better. Another common cause of memory problems are medication side effects. And if the individual works with their doctor and their medications get adjusted, their memory can improve. 
Now we're going to move on to step four, which is treat your memory loss. And we are going to talk about the different FDA approved medications. But before I tell you about the medicines, I need to tell you a little bit more about Alzheimer's disease so you'll understand how they work. Now, Alzheimer's starts, we believe, with the accumulation of a protein called amyloid. The amyloid clusters and clumps together to form these plaques, which is indicated by these big blue arrows. The plaques get bigger and bigger and they start to damage brain cells. The brain cells then have another protein get loose inside them. The protein is called tau and the tau is very sticky and it sticks to itself and it forms these long chains that get all tangled up inside the brain. Now, once the tangles form inside the brain, it kills the brain cells. And the cells are normally making neurotransmitters, chemicals that allow different regions of the brain to talk to one another. And one of the most important of these chemicals is acetylcholine. So in Alzheimer's disease, the levels of acetylcholine drop. It's for this reason that the mainstay of therapy to help memory in Alzheimer's are the so-called cholinesterase inhibitors that help to raise up the levels of acetylcholine. These are medications I bet most of you have heard of. Many of you may be taking these medications. These are medications like denepazil, whose brand name is Aricept, ribostigmine, whose brand name is Exelon, and galantamine. All of these are medications that help to raise up the levels of acetylcholine. Now, from the perspective of the individual and their families, what these medications can do is they can turn the clock back on memory loss by six to 12 months. And what I mean by that is when someone comes in to see me in the office and I write them a prescription for one of these medications, I can make their memory like it was six months ago or maybe even a full year ago. And the sooner they come in to see me, the more likely it is that I can turn that clock back a full year because there's more brain cells that are still living that the medication can work on. Now, I talked about being able to turn the clock back, but unfortunately, I cannot stop the clock from ticking down. So when I see that person two or three years later, yes, indeed, their memory will be worse than when I first saw them in the clinic. But they're always going to be better off being on the medicine than not on the medicine. And if they stop it, what happens is they plummet six to 12 uh, months worth of memory function in one to two weeks. So as long as they had a good initial reaction, we really want them to stay on this medication pretty much forever. Now, wouldn't it be nice if we had a medication that could actually slow down that ticking clock? Well, that is what the medication aducanumab or aduhelm uh, is trying to do. But is it successful? Let's take a look at the data for a minute. As most of you probably know, on June 7th, this new drug was approved for Alzheimer's disease. It is an antibody that's made in the laboratory that sticks to the amyloid plaques that accumulate in the brain. And the idea is then the body's immune system says, oh, this is something bad, and it removes it. Does it work? Well, <clears throat> Biogen and its uh, sister company, ASI, they had two very large, identical 18-month studies each study had over a thousand patients in it. When they looked at the data together of these two studies, they said, oh, doesn't look like it works. Then about six months later, they looked at the information of the two studies separately and they said, oh, you know what? One of these studies looks like it worked. The other study, probably not, but one of them worked. Let's go to the FDA and see if we can get approval. So here's the actual data, and I apologize for showing you a busy slide, but I wanted to show you the real data. 
So uh, what we have here is, let's pay attention just to the y-axis here. The y-axis shows uh, if it's above this dotted line, the drug doesn't work. In fact, it favors placebo. That means if you were on the fake pill, you did better if you're above this line. If it works, where it says favors treatment here, uh, and you're below the line, then it works. Then the drug seems to actually uh, work to help with thinking and memory. If you're right at the line, didn't do anything one way or another. Okay, so if we concentrate on these green and blue circles, these are those very large, uh, greater than a thousand people studied. And the first thing you see is the low dose doesn't do anything, right? The people are right at the baseline. So if you're on the low dose, it doesn't do anything. Now, if you were a participant in the green study and you got the high dose, you went below the line, you got a little bit better. Hey, that's great the amount of improvement was equivalent to turning back the clock three months. So it's not quite as good as the Aricept, but you know it's about somewhere between a quarter to half as good as Aricept. Now, what about if you were in the blue study and you got the high dose? <gasps> you actually got worse if you were on the real drug. And in fact, the amount you got worse is about the same as the amount that the people in the green study got better. Hmm. So if you were in the green study, looks like it worked, but the blue study actually made things worse. In addition to this, uh, I would say, lack of, you know, data showing that it works, 30% of people had brain swelling. So the white areas that you can see here are areas of the brain that had swollen up. And this may be reversible, but could lead to strokes. 10% of people had brain bleeds and brain bleeds are not reversible. That happens and people just have to go on living with these uh, bleeding in the brain. So what do you do with this sort of data? Well, tell you a few other uh, things about it. You need to have a lumbar puncture or an amyloid uh, PET scan to make sure you really have Alzheimer's. You need to take a monthly intravenous infusion forever. It cost $56,000 a year. It's currently not covered by Medicare, by the VA or any insurance uh, company. The side effects include what we talked about. You need MRI scans frequently to monitor for these side effects. So I don't generally recommend it. There are other things I don't recommend too. Prevagen, curcumin, ginkgo biloba, resveratrol. You know, all of these were worthy of being studied, but I am not convinced by the data that any of these really work. Okay. Let's take a look at step five, which is modify your lifestyle. And we're going to talk about the Mediterranean menu of foods. These are the foods that study after study has shown are beneficial for thinking and memory. And in fact, there was just a study that uh, I heard about today that showed that it can also help to slow down the decline in Alzheimer's. So as you can see, it includes fish, olive oil, avocados, fruits and vegetables, nuts and beans, whole grains, and poultry, like chicken. So those, these are the things that are good to eat. So what are the things that are not good to eat? Well, I hate to tell you, it's almost everything else. So red meats, fried foods, fast foods, butter and margarine, pastries, most sweets, white bread, white flour, white rice, sugar sodas, diet sodas, fruit juices, all of these I put in the category of once in a while foods, not every single day food. Now, before everybody gets really depressed and thinks, oh my God, I can never have dessert again. I did want to remind you that chocolate in small amounts has been shown to benefit thinking and memory and mood. You just have to remember that it's what type of chocolate? That's right, dark chocolate. The darker, the better, because it's the cocoa that's good for you, not so much the butter and the sugar and the milk to make it sweet and creamy.
Now we're going to talk about exercise. And I know everyone here knows that exercise is good for you, but I bet you'll be able to tell you at least one new thing about it that you did not know tonight about just how good exercise is for your memory and why. But if I inspire you tonight, before you lace out up your jogging shoes and go running out the door, I do want you to check with your doctor and make sure that your heart and your lungs and your bones and your joints are ready for whatever increased exercise you're going to do. Having said that, there are lots of different exercises that can help. In fact, most of the studies that I'm gonna talk about were done with brisk walking. Now, the exercise that's been most shown to be helpful for thinking and memory is aerobic exercise, which means it gets your heart beating quickly, gets your breathing heavy. That's how you know it's aerobic. And as you can see here, we recommend that people do this at least 30 minutes a day, five days a week. We also recommend two hours a week of exercise that helps with strength and balance and flexibility. Things like yoga, tai chi, pilates, and isometric weightlifting. Well, exercise has so many benefits. It reduces your risk of strokes that could impair your memory. It reduces your risk of falls so you don't hit your head and impair your memory. It reduces depression, which we talked about can be a cause of memory loss. And in fact, exercise is a great natural antidepressant. It also improves sleep. And you might say, well, that's good, Dr. Budson, but what does sleep have to do with memory? It turns out sleep has a lot to do with memory. If your sleep isn't good, you're gonna be tired the next day. And if you're tired the next day, it's gonna be hard to pay attention and you need to pay attention in order to remember things. It also turns out that we make a little bit of this amyloid protein every day, but we clear it out each night while we're sleeping. So we need sleep for that. We also now know that sleep is important to keep our memories for a lifetime. And we talked about how all the new memories are forming in our hippocampus, in our temporal lobes. Well, it turns out that while we sleep, the memories go to an older memory storage place in other areas of the brain. So we need good sleep for this transfer process to take place. But the most exciting thing that I want to tell you about exercise and memory is that exercise actually releases growth factors in the brain that help us grow new brain cells. And in this study here, even older adults, 55 to 80 years of age, had so many new brain cells formed in their brain that you could see the difference in their hippocampus on an MRI scan in as short a time as six months. And the more people exercised, the larger their hippocampus got. Well, speaking of strengthening your hippocampus, let's talk about some approaches to strengthen your memory in general. Turns out that social activities are critically important. Engaging in a novel, cognitively stimulating activity and having a positive mental attitude all help. How does a positive mental attitude help? Well, people that have a positive attitude are more likely to be outgoing and social. They're also more likely to take care of themselves, eat right, and exercise. Now, what about those brain training games? Well, the studies show if you spend a lot of time doing brain training games, you get better at brain training games. It simply does not translate to overall brain function. There are, however, a lot of different strategies that we have written into this book, which by the way, you can get from your local library. So I encourage you to go to the library and, and check it out. If you do want to purchase one, I recommend you support our local bookstores because uh, we want to keep them in business. Um, and all these different strategies here uh, you can use to remember lists, to remember uh, people's names, to remember things you need to do. There's a lot of different strategies that you can use. 
we also uh, recommend different memory aids. So things like uh, uh, smartphone apps, to-do lists, pillbox, calendars, planners, all these things can be helpful. And then finally, uh, in step seven, we talk about how do you keep doing all the things you enjoy doing in life if you're having some memory problems? How do you keep working? How do you keep driving? How do you keep doing your hobbies? And how do you do all these things safely? We also talk about how do you know when is it time to retire from that job? How do you know when is it time to hang up the keys and let someone else do the driving? So now, we are going to transition to the next book, to the six steps in managing Alzheimer's disease and dementia. And again, I am going to read uh, through the uh, preface uh, of uh, this book here, in which I have some quotes from uh, family members to <clears throat> illustrate some of the issues that we talk about in the book. Now, for all you caregivers out there, as I read off one of these quotes, if this resonates with you, please put a Y or a yes uh, into the chat. I always thought I had a lot of patience, but if he asked me what we are doing one more time, I think I will scream. He wants to drive, but I don't know if it's safe. It's happening every evening now. She keeps saying that she needs to go home, but we're already home. Yesterday, I found a pan burning on the stove, so now I can't leave her alone anymore. When I came home from the hairdresser, he asked me who I was. He really didn't recognize me. Well, I don't know if those particular quotes resonate with any of you, but we try to talk about all the different issues that can uh, come up with a caregiver who's caring for a loved one with Alzheimer's or another type of dementia. And we're going to go through these different steps here. Now, step one, understand dementia. We talk about some of the things we already mentioned, like what's the difference between dementia and Alzheimer's disease, what are the different types of dementias, in a bit of detail. So we cover that. Um, step two is about managing problems without medications. And we talk about general approaches and then like every different sort of type of problem that you can imagine. And I'm gonna begin by chatting a little bit about some of our three basic general approach. And the first, is we call the four R's. Some of you may have heard of, of these approaches uh, already. We didn't invent these approaches, but uh, hopefully we've gathered them together for you. Um, the first R is to reassure your loved one that everything's okay. So let's say it's the scenario where your loved one's trying to leave the house to go quote unquote home, even though they're already home. So we wanna reassure them that everything's okay. We then wanna reconsider things from their point of view. From their point of view, they may think they're you know, a, a child again and are trying to get to the home that they grew up in. So we have to reconsider things from that vantage point. We want to redirect them to another activity that is calming and will distract them from uh, whatever it is that is upsetting them or trying to do that's not gonna be helpful, like you know, go to their childhood home when they're you know, 78 years old. And the fourth R is what we as caregivers need to do, which is to take in a deep breath <gasps> and relax. Because if we are feeling even a little bit irritated or frustrated or angry or fed up, we may inadvertently transfer this emotion to our loved one, which will only make the situation worse. Another uh, strategy that is often useful is to start with small steps. So let's say we're trying to give dad a bath. I don't wanna have a bath. 
I had a bath last month. I don't need another bath. You say, well, dad, you know, you really need to take a bath. I don't want to take a bath. So you can start with small steps when you have sort of willfulness or stubbornness uh, like this. You might say, well, dad, there's a little bit of dirt on your nose. Can I just get a washcloth and just uh, clean your nose a little bit? And you have a little bit on your cheeks. So let me just get that. And a little bit on your neck here. And Oh, look, you know, I've got your shirt wet. Let's just take your shirt off so it doesn't get all wet. And then you keep going little by little and either you've given your dad a sponge bath or he now has his clothes off and is ready to go into the tub. Now, sometimes these simple approaches don't, don't work and you need to do sort of a more logical, considered, thoughtful, step-by-step -step approach, uh, which is the ABCs. So the A is for antecedents or what comes before the behavior. You know, so maybe it's bath time, maybe that's the antecedent. The behavior might be yelling for seven minutes, okay? And what's the consequence? The consequences are important to pay attention because it might reinforce the behaviors. So if the consequence of say your dad yelling for seven minutes is that you said, all right, whatever, let's skip the bath today you might have inadvertently just taught your dad at an unconscious level that if he yells for seven minutes, he just has to keep yelling, he'll get his way, right? So using the ABCs can be helpful when there's complicated behaviors that aren't responding to simple things. We then spend a lot of time going through all the different categories or types of memory uh, of, of behavior problems and other types of problems. We talk about if there's memory problems and people are leaving the stove on, you'll want to either unplug the stove or take the knobs off. Um, we talk about how if your loved one is showing signs of wandering, you want to make a plan like today. You don't want to wait till they've actually wandered out of the house to think about how you're going to go about getting them off and uh, getting them back and getting information to the police. Um, if somebody has a false memory, which is very common, you know, your mother might say that she was speaking with her parents, but her parents have been dead for 40 years. Well, I would say, oh, that's nice, mom. And let's take a look at this picture book. We can look at some pictures of your mom and dad. You know, try to uh, use those four R's, redirect them, get them focused on something else. Don't have an argument with them uh, about it. And on that same sort of vein, uh, it's rarely helpful to remind people of their uh, memory problems. So a lot of language problems come up in uh, dementia. People have trouble finding words. They also have trouble understanding uh, speech. And sometimes it's something simple like checking their hearing or making sure their hearing aids are working properly and have good batteries. But don't forget that you can help communication by using pictures and also that nonverbal and emotional communication is often preserved. So tone of voice, body language, gestures, facial expressions, all of those nonverbal communications can help uh, to get your point across. Vision problems are also very, very common. People can have trouble recognizing family members. Sometimes they even think you're replaced by an imposter. And we actually have some strategies of how to deal with this problem, which is not that uncommon. And there are ways that one can cope using other sensory modalities. And of course, you want to make sure their vision and glasses are, are working well. And you can often help a lot of uh, things by increasing the lighting and the contrast. Um, it's also important to work to reduce the impact of hallucinations rather than trying to eliminate hallucination. So the idea is let's make them less bothersome. It's very hard to eliminate them, but we can make them less bothersome. Anxiety and depression are very common and we want to separate those from their lookalikes, which is pseudo-bulbar affect that we talk about. Managing driving is very important. And in a nutshell, I recommend that you have a family member 
ride in the passenger seat, you know, the death seat, while the individual is driving on whatever is their usual route. If the family member is feeling comfortable in the driving seat, in the, sorry, in the passenger seat, then I'm comfortable with the patient driving. But when the family member is uncomfortable, then I feel driving should stop. Um, there's all sorts of different behavioral problems that can uh, come up. We want to remember to look for medical problems. We want to stay safe and either lock up or give away guns and power tools. We want to plan around sundowning. Many people have trouble uh, in the late afternoons, early evenings. They don't do very well. Well, I can't cure sundowning, but we can try and avoid, for example, having family events around times when our loved ones aren't going to be at their best. Have brunches instead of dinners. That can often help a lot. Uh, don't argue with jealousy and paranoia. You're not going to win this sort of logical argument. Use the four R's instead. Don't forget one can use music, uh, whether it's soothing or familiar, can be very helpful. And real pets, robot pets, and even stuffed animals can be helpful. Sleep problems come up all the time. I always recommend starting with a sleep log. I saw a patient just Wednesday that said, Doc, you got to give something for my father. Give him a sleeping pill. He is up at 4 a.m. every morning, waking everybody up. Well, what time does he go to bed? Goes to bed at 8 p.m. I'm like, okay. Well, if he goes to bed at 8 p.m., by 4 a.m., he has had eight hours of sleep. So no wonder he's up. It's like, why don't you put him to bed at 10 p.m. if you want him to get up at 6 a.m.? But then I don't have any time for myself. Well, it's like, I'm sorry. You know, I want you to have time for yourself. That's important. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. But I'm not going to give your father a sleeping pill to sort of keep him unconscious for you know, more than eight hours. So starting with a sleeping log is very helpful. There's important to pay attention to sleep habits because they can keep people up. You want to look for a medical disorder like sleep apnea that may interfere with a good night's rest. And a little melatonin can often be helpful as well. Now, there's all sorts of problems with uh, bodily function. And one of the biggest ones are walking and falls, which of course can be uh, very serious. People can break a hip, people can hit their head, uh, impair their thinking and memory. We have a lot of strategies to help reduce falls and improve walking. There's also a lot of good strategies to reduce incontinence. During the day, we're a big fan of toileting schedules. You know, if they're having accidents every two hours, have them go to the bathroom every hour and a half, whether they feel they need to or not. Bam. Incontinence may be, if not solved, greatly reduced. And there's strategies for uh, nighttime uh, during the sleep incontinence as well. Uh, sometimes heavy silverware and mugs can help to dampen down uh, tremors. So a lot of different things we can do to help with bodily functions. Now, step three is asking about medications. And it's very important to track all sorts of different medicines so you know what your loved one's on, what's their doses, and don't forget to include herbs and supplements. All these different classes of medication can cause problems. But one of the things I'm really pleased about in the book is that uh, Oxford University Press, our publisher, they let us actually sort of list all these different medications uh, that cause problems by both the generic name and the brand name. So you can flip through the book and see if your loved one is on uh, one of these types of medications. Um, we also uh, talk about things that can impair the memory like alcohol. And I think we all sort of know intuitively that even if you have one alcoholic beverage, it is going to impair your memory a little bit. And if you have memory problems to start, it's really going to impair the memory. Now, having said that one alcoholic beverage impairs the memory, it's not going to permanently damage the memory if it's just one. But more than that, could. So I'm a big fan of 
using non-alcoholic beers and wines if you're going to go beyond one drink uh, a day. When we introduce a new medicine we want to help with that behavior, uh, it's important to do a little chart and really quantify how uh, we're expecting to see a change in the medication so we really can tell if it's going to help because medications can help behaviors, they rarely eliminate uh, behaviors. Okay, so um, there are three strategies that we use to try to help with um, uh, behavior problems. The first strategy is to enhance their cognition, to bring it up, because after all, they didn't have the behavior when their thinking and memory was better, right? Before they developed dementia, they didn't have the behavior. So let's see if we can improve it by improving their thinking and memory. The second strategy is to just help them feel a little bit calmer, a little bit more relaxed. And we use the Prozac family of meds to help with this. And the third strategy is to use a little bit more powerful medicines to actually suppress behaviors. And the important thing to mention here is that's the third thing that I reached for, not the first, but sometimes we need to use them. Okay, let's talk about step four, which is build your care team. And we start with you, the most important member of your care team. Uh, my co-author, Dr. Maureen O'Connor, has this wonderful saying, which is you can't pour from an empty cup. So we need to do things to help us fill up our own cup. It's important that we take care of our physical health, our emotional health, that we exercise, we eat well, we sleep well, we keep our social connections. We take time for ourselves in using you know, different uh, techniques like yoga or mindfulness if that's in our, in our practice. Okay. Um, the other thing that we stress very much is that no one person can be managing dementia all by themselves. It's important to engage family and friends and neighbors. And we talk a little bit about how to do that and how to share information and divide up tasks so different people can help with different things. Attending support groups can be very helpful and professional caregivers uh, are very helpful as well. There can be respite care, day programs, the Alzheimer's Association, and of course the doctor should be uh, a help as well. In step five, we talk about how do you sustain your relationship with your loved one? Because the relationships are going to be changing in dementias. Your loved one may also have changing abilities and interests. So you need to take the lead. It's important to plan ahead uh, we recommend starting small, but don't give up. Keep trying. And sometimes you just got to go with the flow. Okay. Now, here is just a list of some of the different ways that people can sustain their uh, relationship. Sometimes it's going out to a museum or performing arts. Uh, sometimes it is staying at home and watching an old movie or listening to music or maybe doing arts and crafts. Don't forget arts and crafts are a lot of fun. Um, and one can exercise together and participate in meaningful uh, activities, maybe even participate in research together. And then the last step, step six, talking about planning for the future. And here we talk about all the issues that are often difficult for families to talk about. We recommend you start early and involve your loved one in the planning as much as they can. Uh, we talk about medical and legal issues, financial issues, how to protect your loved ones from scams and con artists. We talk about how do you know when is it time to transition to a new community and how to make that transition go smoothly. Uh, I can't promise a smooth transition, but there certainly are some wrong ways to do it. So we talk about at least about some of the right ways to make that uh, transition to make it go a little bit uh, easier. Uh, we talk about, again, issues that can be difficult for families to talk about, but things you want to know about ahead of time. 
You know, what is the funeral going to look like? What is the death itself going to look like? What does it mean to be dying from dementia? How do you know if you're close to the end or not? What do you do with the body? You know, how do you plan your own future if you have, you know, pretty much done nothing 24-7 uh, than care for uh, your loved one? So that is the six steps to managing Alzheimer's disease and dementia. And if you're looking for more information, of course, um, you can uh, uh, check the books out from your local library. And Libby is also going to give uh, some of them away for the first 15 people who uh, I think joined us or signed up uh, uh, for the talk tonight. Uh, I also have some blogs on psychology today and Harvard Health that you can take uh, a look at. I have a a website with some uh, resources uh, as well. I don't mind if people email me, that's just fine. People can email me questions after the talk. And uh, you can also follow me on Twitter and Facebook. So uh, thank you uh, very much. It was a pleasure. And if people can type questions into the chat, it would be my pleasure to answer them. Okay. So while people are getting their fingers warmed up, I'm going to ask something that I didn't cover, but actually comes up a lot, which is what's my risk if I have a family member with Alzheimer's disease? What's my risk of getting it? And the answer is that the study suggests that one's risk is increased a bit uh, generally increases twofold to fourfold. So to put some numbers on that, if the risk of developing uh, Alzheimer's disease at age 65 without a family history is about 3%, uh, when uh, you have a family history, that number is doubled to quadrupled, so it's 6 to 12%. So on the one hand, it, it is a big increase in risk. I won't you know, sugarcoat that. But on the other hand, you got an 88% chance of not developing dementia at that age. The other thing to mention is that if you look at everybody with Alzheimer's out there, half of them have a family history, the other half don't. So everyone is at risk for developing uh, Alzheimer's or another uh, type of uh, dementia. So I recommend we all try and do the good things, eat right, exercise, uh, keep a, a healthy uh, uh, attitude, all these things are helpful. Uh, one question here that just came up is, do you have suggestions for helping a relative with dementia who is far away? So, and the answer is absolutely. So you want to coordinate with someone who is closer. And if the person really has dementia, meaning their day-to-day -day function is impaired, there needs to be someone, whether it's a family member, a friend, or uh, uh, someone who is uh, hired to help, like a geriatric care manager, to help the individual uh, with their day-to-day uh, uh, -day, uh, function. And you can contact that person, as well as the individual uh, with dementia, and say, hey, look, I'm over here in Boston area, but I'd still like to help. What can I do? And sometimes it can be doing research on the web to find out different things that could be helpful. Often it could be uh, setting up, for example, electronic bill paying. If it's something that's being done on the web anyways, um, one can set up an online calendar, whether it's a Google calendar or a similar sort of web calendar, perhaps to put all the different appointments on that the individual is going to. You might be able to help them sign up for an online food delivery service. There's all sorts of things that you can do through the web to help an individual with dementia who's living far away. Another question is that uh, one of the individual's uh, uh, spouses was diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's versus uh, uh, early onset Alzheimer's with uh, neuropsychological testing and a PET scan. 
And is there a way to determine how the PET scan can identify if it's definitely Alzheimer's? Well, a PET scan uh, uses a small amount of radioactivity to tell us one of two things. The most common PET scan that's used is what's called an FDG or fluorodeoxyglucose PET scan. And that's a long name, but what it is, is it shows us the pattern of metabolism. And in Alzheimer's, the back of the brain here in the parietal lobes and the temporal lobes uh, close to the hippocampus, those two regions show low metabolism. And when you see that on a PET scan, it is suggestive, but not definitive, that the person has Alzheimer's. When someone is quite young, so it's early onset, which usually is defined as younger than age 65, I actually want a biomarker that is more definitive. And the two ways to do this are either to get a lumbar puncture, which may sound scary, but it's not, and you look for changes in those proteins I had mentioned, in the amyloid protein and the tau proteins, you look to see a pattern, which will suggest it's Alzheimer's. The second way to uh, be sure is there are special amyloid PET scans. So this is a PET scan that instead of you showing brain metabolism, it actually sticks to the amyloid plaques that are up here in the brain if there's any present. And the amyloid PET scans cost about $5,000, are not covered by insurance, but you can get them free by participating in a research study. And if anyone is interested in getting one of these scans for free, if you shoot me an email at abudson at bu for Boston University edu, it would be my pleasure to uh, let you know some of the opportunities uh, in the Boston area of how you can get a free PET scan with uh, research. Um, another question we have here is how much should uh, you tell an individual who is, has Alzheimer's and uh, forgetting things? At this point, uh, she's uh, frustrated by the fact that she's forgetting things. Well, I think it's important to be honest with individuals and to let them know what's going on uh, unless they give you very clear signs that they don't want to be told what's happening. I do think people have the right to refuse information if they don't want it, but I, I don't encourage that. I think people should be informed at some point in the disease, if, if it's clear from the doctors that the individual has Alzheimer's, they should be told at least once that they have it. Now, sometimes people quickly forget that they have it. Um, you know, it sort of depends on the circumstances. Uh, but if somebody's getting frustrated, you know, I would try and help them feel less frustrated. I'd be like, oh, don't worry about that, mom. You know, everybody forgets as they get a little older. Let's not worry about that. You know, just try and, uh, you know, use the four R's and redirect them, reassure them, consider things from their point of view, redirect them to something that's not going to get them upset. So I don't want to lie to them. I want to be honest, but I don't want to beat them over the head with it either. So make sure they know it. You've told them once. If they can't keep it in their head, it's probably not worth telling them again and again and again. Just try and redirect them to other things. Uh, what is the best place, website, et cetera, to look for the latest research on uh, dementia? So um, it's a good question, and it is tricky because there's a lot of misinformation out there as well. I recommend uh, going to sort of large academic medical centers and universities. So at our Boston University Alzheimer's Disease Research Center is one website where we have helpful information about some of the latest research going on. So if you simply Google, you know, Boston University Alzheimer's Disease Center, it, it should, come, uh, should come right up. Um, how can you help 
uh, parents with memory issues accept help. Showering, dressing, going on activities, they've always been so independent, they say they don't need help. Well, as I was uh, mentioning, you might want to, um, you know, so the first thing is to sort of figure out like, well, how impaired are they? Are they able to do these things? It just takes them a very long time, but they're actually able to cook their food themselves. They can do their grocery shopping, you know, themselves. They can, you know, do their, uh, uh, their other activities of daily living. If the individual is actually is able to do all these things, and let's say, you know, what might have taken them an hour before now takes them eight hours, but they can get it done. They're proud that they can handle these things on their own. I think that's okay. I think you have to intervene when they're failing. If they're bouncing checks, uh, you know, their phone service is turned off because they're not paying the bills, um, their taxes are not right, they're leaving the stove on, that's when you have to intervene. And, you know, I tried to give some of those sort of general approaches as to how you might uh, sort of gently say, hey, you know, let, let me help you with that. Let me help you, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, one approach for the finances is, for example, you know, um, you know, I know you think you're going to live forever, dad, but it won't happen. At some point, I'm going to have to help out. And, you know, maybe I could look over your shoulder and sort of learn your system so that, you know, in, let's say, 10 or 20 years, when you're 115, you know, I can, I can help out and take over. Uh, let me learn your system, you know, and then you can hopefully check and see if there's uh, errors that, uh, that come up. Um, okay, and I think the email has been uh, provided, uh, abudson at bu.edu. Uh, yes, yes, yes. The individual just said that early on said the person is 56 years old. I would absolutely recommend somebody 56 years old we want to really make sure that the individual uh, does have Alzheimer's disease before we stop looking for other uh, possible uh, diagnoses. Okay, I think those are all the questions that were typed into the chat. I don't know if it is possible to allow people to unmute themselves, Libby, if it is, and there's a final question or two that people want to ask verbally. I'm okay with that if the technology allows it. Hey, Dr. Budson, so yes, if someone wants to speak, they can click the raise hand and we will um, grant them access to talk. Fantastic. Some people I know just feel more comfortable asking a question out, out loud. Yeah. So Amy, I think you just need to unmute yourself and you can talk. You're good to go, Amy, if you have your question. Oh, Amy, we can't hear you. She said, thank you in the chat. So maybe that's what she was going okay. for. Anybody want to raise their hand and unmute themselves if they wanted to ask a question verbally? Okay, uh, looks like we don't have any other questions. So Libby, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Dr. Budson, I just wanted to say thank you so much for taking the past hour plus to share your um, knowledge and information with us. I'm seeing a lot of people on the chat saying thank you and that it was so helpful. Um, and I hope that Northbridge um, can continue to partner with you and bring more um, series like these to um, our families and local, local seniors. So thank you again. Everyone oh, absolutely! No, I'm, thank you, Dr. Budson. Yeah, absolutely. It's part of my uh, part of my mission, uh, uh, both 
part of my, my role at the VA and uh, at the Boston University Alzheimer's Disease Research Center is to do outreach and education events. And it's my pleasure to do these talks. And it's actually, that's why I write the books because it, it's, it's actually part of, part of my job to educate folks. So happy to do it. Thank you everyone and have a great night. Bye.